Worried about being approved for a mortgage and unsure if you should apply for financing with a local bank? Learn how to navigate bank loans effectively in this episode. So after an extensive study of real estate financing options, and also through my personal experience, it's clear that small banks and credit unions offer unique benefits that larger institutions often overlook. Welcome to Strategy Saturday. I'm Charles Crillo, and today we're going to be diving into top tips for thriving in real estate with small banks. Now, by the end of this episode, you'll clearly understand why small banks and credit unions could be your ticket to smoother real estate investments. Now, get ready to elevate your investment game. Let's jump in and explore how small banks can transform your approach to the real estate game. A small community banks and credit unions are the lifeblood of the real estate investment business, especially for smaller commercial properties and apartment complexes. Their local presence, size, and flexibility make them the ideal lending source for investors. So let's break down real estate lending with local banks. So first off, small community banks usually keep the loans on their books. So they're not selling them on the secondary market, and they determine what types of property loans they want to hold and how much underwriting is necessary. Now, you'll know if you ever purchased a property, like maybe like a regular residential property, and you got approved for one bank here with financing, and then within a few months, you're paying another bank um, your mortgage. That means it was sold on the secondary market. That doesn't happen typically with small community banks. Now, they're most likely to make portfolio loans as well. So this is great if you plan on purchasing smaller properties and refinancing them under one loan. For example, you are buying single family homes and you're uh, renting them out. And maybe after you do five or 10 of them, um, instead of uh, having five or 10 different mortgages on them, what you're going to do is you'll go to a local lending institution like a small bank or credit union, and they will give you one loan um, over all those different properties. Typically, the fees are minimal uh, if you're not using a mortgage broker. Of course, if you're using a mortgage broker, then you have to pay them. Um, put down in below in the comments of what you have paid a mortgage broker before in the past. Now, the process is typically simpler and more straightforward than working through other types of lenders and institutions, and certain banks will allow all kinds of creative financing options, cash out refinancing, low down payments, portfolio loans. They'll even do some sort of uh, lending with a seller financing note. So if you're getting seller financing from a property, maybe um, you can mix it with the bank lending so you can come in with even less of a down payment than you would have if you just went with the bank or with the seller financing. Now let's explore credit union. So you're working with someone you can actually speak to, not set lending in a box. With federal credit unions, there are no prepayment penalties by law, and some states prohibit credit unions from charging prepayment penalties on certain loans. And banks will usually have prepayment penalties on commercial loans that can range from 5% to 1%. They're actually borrowing money from depositors in your community, and they typically have more reasonable fees, especially when rates drop. They offer small business lending, multifamily lending for small and large properties, along with commercial real estate. Now, there's something different that I found out when doing research on this is that there's cooperative credit unions. So there's um, networks of credit unions that can work together. So small credit unions along with larger credit unions to fund large loans. So don't count out your local credit union if you have a large commercial property you're trying to fund. Now, credit unions do not tend to merge, unlike small banks who are always merging. And one of the best examples I've heard about working with credit unions versus large national banks is if you've ever heard the Dave Ramsey show, if someone is behind on a personal loan or car payment when they called into Dave, Dave always asked who the lender was. And he was very relieved when he hears it's a credit union or a small bank. So you actually go into the branch and speak to someone. And it's very typical to be able to adjust a loan if you're having an issue paying. And uh, a personal relationship with these small institutions is cherished. So how do I find small banks and credit unions? Well, small banks and credit unions lending is all relationship driven and investors need to start building those relationships now, even if you don't think you'll require their lending uh, for years into the future. Now I've successfully found good local banks to lend on my real estate investments by simply making a list of small banks and credit unions within say a 45 minute or one hour drive of the property or market and reaching out to all of them. Now, first online or by email, and then getting on calls with the ones who responded by email and seem like a good fit. Now, many of them will not be interested in lending on apartment complexes or certain commercial real estate assets, but you'll find some that are interested. And these are the ones where you want to start building a relationship first by opening a bank account. Now, if you're working directly with a bank or credit union, there shouldn't be much of a risk of being scammed. But if there's any hesitations when dealing with a lender, um, ask for references. 
ask for addresses of properties that they've recently loaned on and avoid paying upfront fees. Now, some lenders like agency lenders might have loan fees that need to be paid up front, but for most lenders, these fees will be paid at closing. I've never prepaid for fees uh, with a when, when I was working with any type of bank. So it's one of those things that uh, it's a red flag if it comes up. Now, always verify the representative you're working with has actually done a loan for a similar property to yours and always get the closing statement before, days before closing to review and always confirm fees throughout the process. Now, your leverage is gone if you get the statement at closing for the first time. Term sheets from credit unions and banks should be marked up and sent back for renegotiation. And this is something that's maybe not talked about that much. And this means that during your loan process, at some point, you're going to get a uh, term sheet from the lender and it's going to tell you exactly what's proposed for your loan, um, what the rate would be, what the terms would be. Um, uh, it'll go through exactly the fees and you can review this and then go back to them. So mark it up and send back for renegotiation. And, um, one thing that I found is every time that I've had an issue with a small bank and I've sent back the term sheet or sent back any of their fees for them to look at again and renegotiate, um, they've always come back. It's usually within only a couple business hours. It's not, this is not like a week process that it might be with a larger institution. And, um, yeah, and they've worked, lowered their fees. So it's something that it's easy to work with these different institutions and they're ready to lend. They're there to lend and they want to close the loan. Now, some pushback I hear from certain investors, usually new investors, is that bank and credit unions are recourse. In other words, you're pledging your personal assets when you take out a loan, which is not the case with agency government loans like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, which are non-recourse. However, most agency loan programs require the property to be stabilized with an occupancy of 90% or higher, and it's not really possible to achieve this with many value-added properties. You know, we're buying properties that are not so great of uh, shape, condition, and we're going in there and we're putting work into uh, changing around management and also renovating the property. So to have a property with that high of occupancy when you buy it is usually um, not what you're going to be finding. Also, non-recourse loans have many carve-outs. They call them bad boy carve-outs that really whittle away the coveted non-recourse label. And this may include maintain the property to a certain condition or occupancy rate, which is obviously you, you can control the condition of your property and occupancy rate. However, who is the one that tells you what that condition has to be? Um, and during an occupancy rate, when we're doing a value add, yes, that... Uh, it's not uncommon for your occupancy rate to go under 90% when you're doing a value added job. So um, these loans are really for uh, properties that are much more stabilized where you're going in and you're not really doing heavy value add, heavy renovations. And you cannot deviate easily from your initial business plan. And this is one thing we found before with agency lenders. If you tell them you're going to do so many units, you've got to do those units. And it doesn't matter if you say you get an offer halfway through the business plan and you sell it, you're still possibly going to have an issue with the agency lender because you didn't do exactly what you said you're going to do. And so if you said you were going to do um, like renovating 50% of the units and you only did 40 of them and you sold it and you pay back the lender in full, you pay back your, uh, your investors in full, you still risk being put on a list that won't allow you to take out another agency loan in the future. This is not something that I've found with banks. They really, obviously, if the property really goes into disarray, but it's not something where they're going to be sending out people uh, and I'm going to be hearing back about the condition of property. I've never heard that with any of my bank loans. If it gets paid, there's no problem. And uh, it's just a much easier uh, situation to work through. For more information on non-recourse and recourse loans, check out my other episode, SS124, which we will link to in the description. So I hope you enjoyed. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe, submit comments and potential show topics at globalinvestorspodcast.com. If you're interested in actively investing in real estate, please check out our courses and mentoring programs at syndicationsuperstars.com. That is syndicationsuperstars.com. Look forward to two more episodes next week. See you then. Have you always wanted to invest in real estate, but didn't have the time, didn't know where to find the deals, couldn't get the funding, and didn't want tenants calling you? Since 2006, I've been buying income-producing properties in great locations that provide us with consistent passive income while we wait for appreciation in the future and take advantage of tax laws while we're waiting. And unlike your financial advisor, we invest alongside our investors in every property we purchase. Check out investwithharborside.com. If you like the idea of investing in real estate, if you like the idea of passive income, partner with us at investwithharborside.com. That's investwithharborside.com.
Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Syndication Superstars LLC exclusively.